Did you miss your deadline to renew your Medicaid coverage? You can still send your completed annual review form to Healthy Connections Medicaid. You may be assigned to another health plan, but you can ask to come back to First Choice within 60 days of renewed Medicaid eligibility. It's your family. It's your choice. First Choice is the right choice. Renew and choose us. Visit selecthealthofsc.com slash renew to learn more. Welcome back to the podcast and welcome to another recording of Jester Section Hiker, your premier podcast with the spotlight on section hikers. And I am excited for who is our guest this afternoon. She has recently written an article that has defined section hiking in a way that I have been trying to define here on the podcast. For about the last four years, and I'm excited to have Liz Thomas on the show, also known as Snorkel, and this interview is going to be an excellent way to round out year four of the podcast before we head into the holiday season, and Liz is here, and we've already been chatting it up. I want to give Liz a proper introduction before I bring her on. And if you guys know Liz Thomas, she is an amazing hiker. I have been following her since 2011 or maybe fangirling uh, Liz since 2011. She set a self-supported record on the Appalachian Trail and 2011 seemed to be uh, the year of women on the AT. But I am actually going to read you um, a proper introduction from Liz's website. It says that uh, Liz Thomas is a professional hiker, adventure, conservationist, and outdoor writer who broke the women's self-supported supported speed record on the Appalachian Trail. She is considered among the most experienced hikers in the U.S., She's known for backpacking light, fast, and solo. Liz has hiked more than 20,000 miles on 25-plus long-distance trails, including completing the Triple Crown of Hiking, and you guys know that's the Appalachian Trail, PCT, and the Continental Divide. And she's first known to have traverses on, I'm going to mess this up, on the uh, Chinook Trail, in the Columbia River Gorge and the Wasatch Range in Utah, and that just scratches the surface. Liz also is an author. She is a writer. She is a co-founder of her own company, and you all have heard enough from me. I think we need to go ahead and bring Liz on. So please welcome to the podcast, Liz Thomas, also known as Snorkel when she's out there hiking. Hey, Liz, what's happening? Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Not a problem. Uh, Hopefully I did that introduction proper. You have so much. Um, Another thing I wanted to say as I continued reading this, you also have a master's in environmental science from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. I mean, that is amazing. (laughs) Thank you. And, you know, the fun thing about that, too, was that I was looking at long distance trails and conservation along the trails and what it takes to protect them. So it was all related to hiking still. You have so many accolades and you have so many miles on trail. But I want to go back and start when I actually started following you. And I'm not quite sure how. Maybe Facebook, maybe an article in a magazine, and 2011 seemed to be a year for women on the Appalachian Trail. You set the self-supported record. So since the Appalachian Trail is my roots as a section hiker, let's go back to 2011 and share with us a little bit about that trek. And did you intend to set a self-supported record? Yeah, I uh, went out with sort of a goal of going, giving my all. You know, I don't know if the FKT website existed, the sort of record keeping around how fast 
people had hiked the AT was a little bit more of like word of mouth. Um, so I based it on what I thought the number was. On the fastest known time website, it's 80 days, 13 hours, 11 minutes. Pretty darn good. How would you compare your adventure on the AT? 80 days doesn't seem unheard of now, but how would you compare your adventure back then? Yeah, I mean, it was lonely. And that seems ironic, you saying it was lonely, because now the, it, it seems it's the Appalachian Highway, right? Yeah, it does seem kind of ironic thinking about it. But being ahead of the pack, getting to Katahdin that early on, don't even remember what my number was when I got it. But it was like, I didn't see people. You know, there were days when I saw one or two people and that was it. So what was your strategy? Did you set off like, hey, I've only got a certain number of days? I'm gonna, or did you just get into the rhythm of your hike? It was a kind of a rhythm of my hike, you know, as the, as the days got longer, I was putting in more hours. And as I got stronger, I was putting more hours per day. So that helped a lot. But I don't know, it's fun. And I had hiked the AT before. So being able to look forward to the next day and be like, oh, remember, there's going to be a waterfall coming up. Or what does it look like around that bend? I was just so excited to be back out there. Oh, I did realize you had hiked it before. So when was your first trick? My first was 2008. Okay, so you certainly didn't see a lot of women out there in 2008. No, not at all. No, like maybe one in 10 back then. So why do the AT again? Why go again in 2011? I, you know, there were a couple of reasons, you know, trying to see how fast I could do it was one of it, one of them. But I had hiked the Continental Divide Trail in 2010, and that trail was so hard at the time. You know, no GPS. The trail wasn't finished. The trail wasn't signed. And I just kind of, while I was hiking the CDT, I thought of the AT as sort of this fantasy land where I didn't have to worry about running out of water. What you're saying is what I'm thinking. Uh, even in my uh, future endeavors, I'm like, the AT, it just seems like home. I know where the blazes are. I know how to find my way. And I could just hike. Yeah, just kind of hike, put one foot in front of the other, get my mind in the groove. And um, a lot of the worries that I feel like are common on other trails. It's like you go out there and you're just in nature and doing it. So did that fuel your passion for doing more through hikes, for getting involved more in your riding career in the outdoor industry? I know that you've written for Backpacker. We're getting to talk about, we're getting ready to talk about an article that you wrote for, which is a fantastic article that you wrote recently for Far Out. So what fueled that passion as far as your everyday nine to five business life? Yeah, I mean, I think it was very hard, especially at that time period, because so few people knew what through hiking was. I really felt like I had to like put myself out there. I have, have enjoyed writing since I was very small. And my family had told me like, there's no money in being a writer, which is still true and kind of discouraged me from it. But I think being out there on trail made me realize, you know, there's a lot of things that people say you can't do and um, I should I should try it. Yeah. So 2008 AT, then you went to the CDT and then you came back to the AT. Hopefully I'm getting this, these in order. Where did the first PCT trek come in? That was the year after my AT hike. So and that was 2012. 2009. 2009. Okay. Meet 910 for my triple crown. So all the PCT, did you even remotely think about wildfires? Were you worried about the water? It seems everything now that the PCT is, now it's like, can I make it from the southern end of California to that Canadian border? Did you worry about stuff like that back in 09? I would say I was worried about my physical capability to do it, not about natural disasters. <laughs> stopping me. I did have a wildfire happen in Washington and there was a reroute, but it, you know, it was such a rare thing that they had actually set up a ranger who escorted hikers around the fire. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that, that was my fire reroute. It was, you know, it was smoky for a few hours and that, that was it in terms of wildfires. And then water, I feel like water is actually better now, maybe just because the information is out there, there might be some more trail angels caching, whereas you know, I would go to the library and print out a water report who and you have no idea how many days old it is and whether it's still accurate in order to get water information. So, I mean, something like the Far Out app that exists now is at least better, more accurate, up to date information. 
So you did all of these hikes without the capability of far out, all the mapping, everything was online. And I'm sure if you wanted to do any blogging, you went to the library. And that just seems unheard of now. Did you hike with any technology at all with a phone? So my first AT hike, I had a phone. It wasn't a smartphone. Uh, The iPhone hadn't been invented yet. And, you know, it got wet in the rain because I didn't really know how to, you know, my first hike, I didn't properly know how to keep stuff dry. It's wild to think that's how we used to hike. Yeah. And now I'm even thinking like Garmin inReach, a spot device. Did you have any of that with you? Not in those times, no. You've got these hikes under your belt. You've got the triple crowd under your belt. And I read something on your website to introduce you. I'm extremely interested in just for personal reasons. I don't know if I said that right. The Chinook Trail. I've heard Chinook. Yeah. Okay. So that is an unknown traverse. I've heard of it, but is it all off trail? No. So it actually, I think in like the early 90s, received National Recreation Trail status. So it's a recognized trail. It's not complete and it's something they've been working on. But it's something that theirs was a trail organization, but no one had ever hiked the trail before. It was more like an idea. And my friend Whitney Allgood LaRuffa and I were looking at maps and saying, hey, there's something pretty close to Portland where he lives. It's a long distance hike that we haven't heard of. Why don't we go out there and hike it? There you go. So what kind of explain the terrain? Tell us about it. It's got a little bit of everything. You start out in that sort of Pacific Northwest temperate rainforest, and then you get more into the sort of high deserty sort of open grasslands as you get further east. You cross the Columbia River, and then you go back to those high grasslands down to out towards Mount Hood where there's waterfalls and pine trees. And then back down to that temperate rainforest. So it's sort of a horseshoe traverse of the Columbia River Gorge, which is just beautiful and really diverse terrain. How many miles is it? A little bit more than 300. And what did you guys use at that time to go around? We had paper maps that we had doodles on. And we had we did have some software that we looked at online. I think it was like the Nat Geo software because we needed to figure out where these connector trails were because there's no line on the map that says Chinook Trail. It didn't really exist at the time. And, you know, maps online sometimes lie. So we would get to some junctions that there's no junction there. There's no signs. The trees have completely, completely taken over the trail. So, I mean, that that was kind of the fun thing about being the first to do a route is you don't actually know if it's going to be there on the ground. So uh, of these 25 plus treks through hikes, whatever you want to call them that you've done, Is there one that stands out as the most unique? I mean, obviously you did the Triple Crown, but is there something that is really unique that you hold dear that like really grabs your heartstrings? I always think of the next trail or the trail I was most recently on really grabs my heartstrings. This was a a while ago, but the Pacific Northwest Trail I really enjoyed. It's a different kind of trail. It's an east-west trail. So you're going up and over, I want to say like eight mountain ranges or something. And it, it's pretty lonely, but I, I think there was something really magical about that trail. It goes past some of the most scenic areas, I think, on any long distance trail I've been on. I've had a couple section hikers on here that are, you know, working their way through on the Pacific Northwest Trail, and they love it. Yeah. And one of the things they love is the remoteness. Yeah. And that's one where fires are a big deal. You know, water is also a big deal. But yeah, it's so remote. And it, it goes from that sort of high desert to temperate rainforest to right under a glacier to the beach. It's just like a little bit of everything. Just out of curiosity, getting ready to go on one of these long treks, are you like a super obsessive planner? Are you like, oh, I'm just going to throw my backpack on and wing it and go? Like, what's Liz doing to prep? I'm better than a little bit like, uh, I'm better than throw it all in a backpack, but I am not the biggest planner. I do send boxes. I will get my boxes all planned out. Well, that's a lot of work itself. I do kind of a hybrid where I figure out which towns I'm going to probably need a box or else it's going to be a a little bit um, nothing but candy bars if I don't send a box. And yeah, I'll figure out if I need any permits and that's about it. You know, I figure out how to get there. Don't buy a ticket back. Well, there you go. You don't put a time limit on it then. Right. I used to sit down and be like, here's how many miles I do per day. And I think I'm going to camp at this place. And it just goes out the window. So, you know, sometimes that's fun to do just for fun. But ultimately, I can't control the weather. I can't control how strong I'm feeling. I can't control 
maybe I make a friend who's going faster or slower. I think it's a good exercise, especially for, for people going on their first hike. It's been much more useful for me to just wing it. Where are you now with your gear? Are you to the point where it's like, okay, you just grab and go? So I own a gear review website called Treeline Review, which I co-founded with my hiking partner, actually from the Pacific Northwest Trail and the Great Divide Trail. And, you know, I think of gear as a tool. It's not something, it's there to serve me. And so some people are into gear just because they love gear. I think of it more of a very like functional, does it serve its purpose as I'm taking it out? I always like to play around, throw in some new things every trip that I take. But it's, yeah, I would say I my, my kid is pretty dialed in. I usually only experiment with a few things. For example, I was, I was just on the Arizona Trail. I had a different backpack than I normally use, but I kept the sleeping bag and sleeping pad and the tent all the same. So I'll mess with like one of the big three. There's comfort in having that sort of consistency, knowing things are going to work, knowing their quirks. So I'll mess with one. If you had one thing, uh, like for me, um, when I go out on a hike, my number one thing is always my shoes and taking care of my feet. Do you have like that number one thing that you know you have to take care of, that you know you have to pay special caution to? I'm with you. I think feet is really, really important. I might try the like cushier version of the same shoes I have or the taller version of the socks or the shorter version of the socks, but that's as much experimenting as I'm getting. Yeah. So once you dial in, so what are you wearing? Yeah, I wear, I'm pretty classic West Coast. I wear ultra lone peaks and darn tough quarter hikers. Yeah. And, you know, I like to, I was actually thinking about this and I've been hiking for so long. When I, I started using Darn Tough on the AT, you couldn't get Darn Tough on the West Coast, really. It was, it was a lot of work. And I was one of the early ambassadors. So what backpack do you have? I've been switching off on backpacks pretty much since I started Treeline Review. But for the longest time, I was all about the Gossamer Gear Kumo. I love that pack. On the Arizona Trail, I took a, the Z-Pax Arcol. That was a great pack as well. Very good for that trek. You know, I like to experiment there as well. You have completed the Arizona National Scenic Trail, so congratulations on that. How was that trek? When did you start and when did you finish? I started at the beginning of October and I finished at the the, the beginning of November. And you were flying. Yeah. I mean, it's such a fun trail. I really loved being out there. And I think that's one thing maybe I do a little bit different than people, other people who are are going fast. Just like, I'm doing it because I love doing it because it's really fun. And even if I'm getting up in the dark and hiking, like I'm doing it because like I think it's pretty cool to watch the morning get brighter and brighter. I think it's pretty cool to hike when the moon is full. It's a beautiful trail. It's a great trail. And you went south, right? I did. Yeah. So did you sit back and say, hey, I'm looking for a particular weather window? Because I know on that one with the Grand Canyon and heading south into the desert, did you purposely go at the beginning of October? I did. Yeah. Which I think is kind of a sweet spot. I mean, you know, frozen water bottles. Two days before I started, it snowed on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. So you really like you're at 9000 feet when you're essentially like day two or three. But then you get down to the desert and, you know, it was 103 degrees for me. Admittedly, it was a heat wave in the section closest to Phoenix. But, you know, you kind of get a little bit of everything. I've heard that trail will shock you. Like you would think it, you know, I think desert terrain and I think, oh, nice, smooth trail. But that's not the case. No, it's really rocky. And that's why I wore the Ultra Olympus on that trail. I'd been warned by friends like, hey, it's not all sand. There are some big rocks and they don't go away. So congratulations on that. I do want to get to this far out article. And I think I was scrolling through uh, Instagram And I saw the uh, article pop up and the title of this article, it says, I've through hiked and section hiked the PCT, which is better. And so I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. Oh, that's Liz. Let me see uh, what she has to say. And I love this first sentence and I want to read this. It says, I've completed the PCT twice, once as a four month through hike from Mexico to Canada and once as a nearly 10-year section hike, people ask me which is better. So instead of me reading further, I'm going to ask you which is better. There is nothing quite like like the sort of community that you make, especially on your first through hike. But I actually had more fun on my section. Yes, yes. All section hikers are now rejoicing. <laughs> 
Um, you actually went on to say that you said, while I always treasure the exhilaration of finishing finishing my first end to end hike and the friendships formed over many months, ultimately I found the section hike more satisfying. I think, you know, if you know yourself, and especially this is probably true for people who are, you know, maybe not in their their early 20s, using it through hike as a way to figure themselves out, which I've also done. You know, I kind of had an idea of what I wanted my time on trail to be like. And, you know, especially as I get older, it's like, I don't want to think about work. I don't want to think about all my stressors. I want to go out and be in nature and not have to worry about competing with others for tent sites, just have this really peaceful experience. And so I think for that, you know, just going out wherever the trail might have you might have left the trail and starting back up, it feels like, you know, it feels like returning to an old friend. So did you have any rhyme or reason? When I section hiked the AT, I was kind of all over the place. And it sounds like you may have done the same thing or were you very rigid? I think section hikers can do, can hike however they want to hike. I was not rigid. And part of that was because I was saying, oh, I'm going to be up in Portland for this other thing. Why don't I just hike north and you know, do that section. Or, oh, I'm going to be in the Tahoe area. I can hike south and finish that section. So it was really about trying to take where my life was sending me anyway and trying to incorporate the trail into my life. In this article, I so resonated when you said that the trail was a constant that you could rely on. And for myself, it took me 12 years um, to section hike the AT. It was a constant thing that was on my brain when I was going to get back to the trail. Admittedly, it's been very hard for me. You know, you do something for so long and that constant is gone and there's this void. And it's like, what do I do now? Well, I start again. So I started filling in gaps on another section hike of the AT. But I love that you said that. Expand on that. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't a day where I wasn't thinking, how do I get back to the PCT and and connect the, you know, these hundred miles that I need to do or connect these 50 miles that I need to do over here? It was always there, kind of, you know, like it was like a watch that I was always wearing or something. (laughs) I I wouldn't think it was on my side. It was something that I looked forward to. And, you know, sometimes it, it was a spot of peace, too. If I was stressed about something or bored on a plane or whatever, I'd be like, oh, how am I going to do that and start mapping? You know what? I said, you know, it's a fun exercise to figure out where I'm going to camp every night. Sometimes I did that for those sections that I knew I had coming up just just to, you know, have something to really, really look forward to. Did you know it was going to be 10 years? No. (laughs) So what in your mind you thought, oh, I'll section hike this and be done in a couple of years. Walk us through that. Yeah. So I actually started my PCT, 10-year PCT section hike as an attempt of an FKT. And that did not work out. But I kept thinking, you know, I, I want to hike the PCT again. Can I do this as a section hiker? And so that sort of transition of like very fast through hike to like sort of a s- slower, more contemplative, long-term experience, I feel like I learned and grew a lot because of it. And I keep referring back to this article You have a statement here. You said uh, there's a puzzle that you're putting together. And on the PCT, Canada fever, on the AT, it would be Katahdin fever. Canada fever is a real thing for through hikers. You said as a section hiker, it's chronic. And I am like, yes, it never goes away. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the thing about Canada fever or Katahdin fever is I certainly meet hikers in Maine or hikers in Washington who are just like, I just want to be done with this and touch that border and go home and be able to eat all I want. And when I'm on a section hike, that's not what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, it's great out here. I want to stay here forever. It's a very different way to experience the trail, especially towards the end of a trail. I'm I'm still going to keep referring back to this article because it is so good. It is so good. Um, uh, the title of this next little piece of the article says judgment in the hiking community. The name of this podcast is part of some of this judgment. So my trail name is Jester. And then if you add Jester section hiker together, it kind of sounds like just a section hiker that goes in with some of the judgment from the hiking community and one of the things you said it was challenging of the section hiking, especially when you encountered through hikers, there was judgment because they automatically assumed 
if they didn't know who you were, that, you know, you were new to trails, sometimes thing, you know, through hikers were condescending or other people that you met on the trail. Walk us through your thought process when you wrote that section. I definitely had some experiences where I would run into through hikers and they would be like, oh, you know, when you get to this section, you're going to want this gear or like, oh, you know, like you're really going to want to lighten up or whatever. And, you know, I wanted to be like, I know a lot about gear. I actually own a gear review website, but that's not really my personality. Be like, I want to tell you my whole hiking resume. We've got a question here from the chat that I think is appropriate as well as we're talking about your PCT section hike. Sean says, would it be safe to say that a section hike of the PCT would complete more of the trail than a through hike because of the fires? I think, you know, it's not just fires too, it's snow. It's fires that happened several years ago where the trail sections are still closed. Yeah, the PCT, it's really been impacted in the last 10 years by these natural disasters. And this year, the high Sierras as well. I mean, people that not only were hiking the PCT, but got John Muir Trail permits. A lot of the bridges were washed out. I don't know where that stands right now. But, you know, if you're on the East Coast and you're planning your whole life around, hey, I'm going to do this section, you're going to be disappointed. And I don't know, you know, the thing is, I guess people get to the Sierra and they make a decision. They got to go around. I mean, there is no other choice. Yeah. And, I, you know, to, to the class of 2023's credit this year, this is the first year in a while where fortunately no hiker has lost their life in this year that I know of. And I really credit that to hikers making smart decisions and and for talking about, you know, this is an acceptable and smart decision to make. And if you come back next year and your through hike turns into section hike, that is an acceptable and culturally okay decision within our community. I'd love for you to expand on that because I think there's a culture out there that if you're a through hiker, you don't want to be a section hiker because you had to get off the trail. And you just made the statement, hey, no big deal. Pick yourself back up and, you know, pick up where you left off. Why do you, what do you think that is? I think like Sean was saying, I don't even, it is, it's very hard these days to be able to have continuous footsteps on the PCT or the CDT. They're long trails. Their fires are everywhere. Snow is everywhere. And I think the more we, we realize hey, it's okay to go out. It's great to go out for a section and realize that's going to be the reality for pretty much everyone who goes on these long trails, no matter how many months you have to go do it. I think that's going to be a really important part of our hiking culture going forward. What overall, I just love this article so much. I'm going to continue to read it. I'm going to continue to refer to it, you know, as I go forward with the podcast. Because so much of what you put on here is what a section hiker deals with when they go out of the trail that, oh, you're just a section hiker. You're only out for a week or a couple hundred miles versus, you know, a through hiker that something happens, they get injured, they can't make it. It's all okay is the moral of the story that I get out of your article. What prompted you to write this article? You know, it was really a big revelation for me because I had thought of myself as a through hiker. And part of it was that I had experienced what section, how sex and hikers are treated by through hikers. And I was like, hey, we really need to change the dialogue around through hikers and section hikers. We're all hikers. We're all out there on the same trail, having a great time. Some of us are going to hit different weather. Some of us are going to hit fires more than others. But, you know, are we having a great time on trail? That's ultimately what this is about. And you also said when you were out section hiking, you saw different parts of the trail in different seasons and you could do that. Do you have a comparison maybe in your mind from when you were through hiking versus on your section hike? Oh, yeah. I think of Northern California as a a prime example. I hated it as a through hiker, (laughs) as a through hiker. It was 100 degrees. All I wanted, you know, I thought a lot about quitting when I was on that section. It was miserable. And as a southbounder going in September, it is beautiful. Lakes everywhere, flowers, you know, these weird bog pitcher plants. I could really appreciate how cool this area was. And I don't, I barely remember anything from my northbound other than I wanted to be over. This one section, the Hat Creek Rim, I had a friend who'd worked on trail crew there who was like, my favorite section of the PCT is the Hat Creek Rim. And I was like, are you kidding me? It's hot. There's no water. 
it's ugly. Going as a section hiker, I got snowed on. I could really appreciate the view from there. And, you know, it's just a different, different experience. Well, Liz, you have revived us as section hikers that it is definitely a okay. And I encourage everybody, that article is going to be in the description below. And uh, yeah, so thanks for representing both sides of the story. So talk to us about Treeline Review. Yeah, Treeline Review, I started five years ago with my hiking partner, Nami Huditz. Um, we'd hiked the Great Divide Trail together. We'd hiked Badwater to Mount Whitney together and the Pacific Northwest Trail together. And, you know, one of the things I think, especially as a woman, that I felt like was missing from a lot of gear review sites was that the sort of people who were running gear reviews didn't look like me, didn't have my experience. And I actually had a, an editor for a gear magazine tell me, I was like, what about women's gear? And he says, oh, I just write it and then put my wife's name on it. And I was like, what? 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 Um, and I was told women can't write gear reviews. Absolutely not. Women can write gear reviews. Right, right. So um, fast forward a few years later, I was hired by the New York Times Wirecutter to be on their outdoor gear review team. And I worked there for several years, had a lot of fun doing these very objective, very sort of science labby based gear reviews. They decided that the outdoors doesn't make money and cut our team. And a bunch of our team members said, hey, you know, we had a really amazing thing going on here doing side by side, almost consumer report style gear reviews. Why don't we start up something that's the same idea? So that's what Treeline Review is based on. You do a little bit of everything, right? Yeah, we started with hiking, backpacking, through hiking. And, you know, over time, I met amazing people who do skiing, rafting, mountain biking, bike packing. Yeah, running. We've got a really big running section. So, yeah, it's been fun for me to work with these other really excited people who kind of get what makes our gear reviews different and are totally willing to, to go along for the ride. And you also have a book that I want to talk about. I'm looking at it here on Amazon, and I'll make sure that is in the description below, too. It's Long Trails, Mastering the Art of the Through Hike. So it's really set up so that you can sit down over a bowl of cereal at breakfast and, you know, read for 10 minutes. And it's meant to be, you know, I really thought with my publisher to be like, I want pictures of real people on trail, not models. I want people who are dirty, filthy, haven't showered for a week, and are the happiest, just glowing with the experience of being on trail. And that's what it is. Give us a little taste of what is actually in the book. If I were to rename the book, that was kind of a working name that ended up going to publication. I would call it Dream to Reality. And it, it's really set up from the first time you hear that a long distance trail exists or that long distance hiking is something that a human can do all the way to what does the nitty gritty look like day to day. We talk about, you know, should I through hike? Should I section hike? When should I start? What trails even exist? how do I choose which trails to, to go on all the way to, and this is something that I didn't see in a lot of backpacking or through hiking books was, how do I tell my family that I'm going to be gone for a while? How do I save up to go on this trip? How do I tell my boss? And, you know, that seems like that those are the questions I get asked the most when I go on these hikes. That seems common sense, but it's not. It's not. When I wrote that book, there, there were no books in print by outdoor publishers on how to through hike by a woman, by a person of color. And I was like, I really feel like maybe the questions that I get asked are different than what other people get asked. But these are really, really important things that you have to figure out before you figure out your gear, before you figure out what to do with bears or what you eat. It's, you know, how do I even get on the trail in the first place? I love that you said that, especially about the family, because... Trying to explain to your family what you're doing, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to be on a trail for, you know, four to six months or, hey, I'm going to start section hiking this trail and it's going to take me 12 years. And your family's like, wait a minute. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I have found is when your family understands, they want to go along with you. Yeah. Or they want to come meet you along the way or they want to send your boxes. And, you know, after I finished, I'd been hiking for maybe 10 years. And after I finished writing this book, I gave it to my family. And it really put together all the things they'd kind of been seeing bits and pieces. And they were like, oh, now I understand what you do. 
Well, listen, everybody needs to get this book. And um, I want to sign off by asking you the obvious, what is next? You just got off the Arizona Trail. Again, congratulations. Is there another long trek? Is there another section hike? What's next for Liz? Yeah, I have a permit to hike the Trans-Catalina Trail over New Year's, which should be really great. It's this island off the coast of California that is pretty popular for people to go hike. And yeah, you know, I have I I have finished section hiking the PCT. And as you were saying, now now that I've finished, I'm kind of like, oh, what's my next section hike that I want to be thinking about all the time, every day? And so I've been thinking about section hiking the Continental Divide Trail. I think that's actually going to be a better and more fun way to experience that trail. And I'm looking forward to it. So when you do, where are you going first? You know, a little bit of depends on the snow season, the fire season, when I feel like there's a gap enough in work that I can take off for a little bit of time to go hike. So I'm playing it by ear, but I'm thinking a lot about either Colorado in the summer or possibly I loved being in New Mexico in the fall, possibly doing that. But yeah, I mean. Okay, so wait a minute. I'm picking up on something here. So you are a triple crowd through hiker. Is there a triple crowd section hiker in your vibe as well? Is that is that you think you would section hike the CDT and then maybe section hike uh, the AT? Yeah, I've thought about section hiking the AT in the fall because I really want to be able to capture the fall colors in all the different places. You know, fall colors are great in Maine, but they're also great in Virginia. And there's no way you can really see both if you're through hiking. I'm one of those West Coast hikers who loves the AT and loves all, I love the green tunnel, but you can kind of see in the background, I have some, some paintings and they're all of the AT. Do you have a favorite amongst uh, the three in the triple crown? I think it's kind of like, you know, how do you choose between your kids? I think they're, they're all wonderful to hike. On your website, you have a whole section on urban hiking. So how did that develop? It happened in the most random way. Someone went to my website and left sent me a cold email saying, hey, I've put together this route that is an urban through hike. It's 200 miles to all of the public stairways in Los Angeles. I was living in Colorado at the time. It was winter and I was like, go hike 200 miles, snow free. I'll go do this. And I loved it. It was so much more elevation gain than I was expecting. You know, it was like AT style, just up and down 500 foot climbs. And I was like, you know, there's a lot in common between this urban through hiking and through hiking as I know it in wild areas. You know, I still have this sort of physical activity, this purpose when I wake up in the morning being like, when I wake up in the morning, I know I'm going to walk and I'm going to sleep in a different place every night. I slept in different people's houses along the way on that trip. And I don't know what I'm going to see. I'm going to meet some cool people along the way. I loved it. And so I started doing more of these urban through hikes and I've done them in 14 cities. What is this Denver one to the breweries? Yes. So I was like, you know, there's no there, there's like maybe two public stairways in Denver, but there's a lot of breweries. What if I were to hike to all of the breweries is one hike, one connected foot footsteps hike. I think it ended up being 67 breweries that, that I went to, which was all the breweries in Denver. And as you can imagine, I did do a pint at every single brewery, but I, I would do it at, at least a taster at every brewery. Well, listen, Liz, this has been exceptional, and uh, I have truly admired you for a long time, Um, read a bunch of your articles, and when I saw that Far Out article, I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to reach out to her and uh, see if she will be on the podcast and stand up for all section hikers out there, and uh, I think you did. So thank you very much for coming on the show. Give me just a second. I'm going to switch the screen. I'm going to close out the show and hang on, Liz. I'll be right back with you. All right, you guys, right here on the Jester Section Hiker podcast, Liz Thomas has proclaimed uh, that section hiking is where it's at. And Liz, again, I really appreciate you joining me on the show. This was an excellent way to close out season four or year four of the podcast right before the holidays. I wish you all happy holidays. As always, thanks for listening. Be safe out there and happy section hiking.
Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account, where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC.